Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our evening session here of the Virtual Astro Cafe. Uh, we are very happy today to bring you a presentation of the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, for such an important and huge milestone for humanity, uh, we would have to have our very respected uh, Dr. Chong to discuss about this. Uh, and this James Webb Space Telescope, as uh, we'll find out, uh, has been delayed for so many years. And so before our talk started, uh, Dr. Chong was saying that, oh, he's been waiting for so long that his <laughs> neck was almost becoming a giraffe maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, so many years this telescope and it has been delayed. And finally, we are about to witness its launch uh, okay, uh, in another couple of months. So um, this uh, Virtual Astro Cafe is, of course, brought to you by the Astronomical Society of Penang. So uh, we certainly appreciate you tuning in. And uh, please like and subscribe our channel and our Facebook page. So uh, Dr. Chong, uh, let, us, let us start the presentation. So I, I think that uh, both of us will be talking about this James Webb Space Telescope, yeah. right? Yes, sir. So uh, le let me start off with uh, some introduction, and then uh, probably we'll have you add in a lot of the technical details. And uh, I know that you have uh, some slides that uh, you like to share as well, which uh, has some videos and stuff like that, I think. Uh, so so uh, we'll, we'll do it this way, our presentation. So um, let me share my screen, okay. Um, so I'm going to share my slides right here, okay. And uh, so again, before we really begin and go into this uh, topic, uh, let me talk really briefly about the Astronomical Society of Penang, which uh, we now have a website called astronomicalsocietyofpenang.com. So I hope that uh, everyone can go and visit. Uh, why do you want to go visit? Uh, there are lots of uh, updates on the latest astronomical events. We also have a program called What's Up in the Sky. And in there, you can uh, watch a video about okay, what you can see in the months of, uh, you know, so for this month, October 2021, and then for November, December, etc., we'll have a video that talks about it. We also have a downloadable PDF for you guys to download and reference. Okay, and of course, not to forget the very awesome uh, astro photos from our members. So we have a member uh, gallery of astro photos. Uh, which uh, we have highlighted on our Astronomical Society of Penang website. Okay. Uh, also, want to mention again, okay, if you are into astrophotography, you do take photos of the stars. Um, we are hosting, organizing an astrophotography contest for 2021. The closing date for submission is October 31st, 2021. So uh, you have about just two weeks to finish your pictures and submit it in. Uh, so we certainly hope to see your submission and uh, we'll look forward to announcing the winners. Uh, at, at the end uh, of the Dr. Day. Day. I'll just add on yes. a bit. Huh? Just, add, oh, yeah. just add, add on a bit, okay? Yes, so yes, basically, yes. Uh, the Astronomy Society of Penang is, has a long history and a rich history. So in a sense, we are actually on the island of Penang on the northeastern corner of Peninsular Malaysia. And in a sense, the astronomy uh, activity started in Penang in the 1980s. So in a sense, we have a 40-year history. And since then, they have built up a very strong and dedicated amateur astronomy community. All right? So that's what we are doing. Okay, Derek, you can continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Chong. Yeah, and, and certainly this history, uh, uh, Dr. Chong is... Uh, currently the president of Astronomical Society of Penang, and he has led so much of uh, astronomy activities in, in Penang that, uh, um, and, and his name is like, everyone knows you now. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I think that uh, if, if you're interested in astronomy, certainly join us and visit our website too. So now without further ado, let's not hold this up, okay? Um, 
we will talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. But before we get there, we have to talk about what we have right now. Okay, and why are we heading towards this James Webb Space Telescope? So uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is the is of course the more popular of our current space telescope. There's also the Spitzer, um, and I, I, I'm not sure that there, there are probably more. Dr. Chong, there's some more space telescopes, are they other than yeah. the Spitzer? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just add on now this. So very appropriate that Darren, you add on this Hubble picture. So basically, it's, it's like this. So the internet came to Unicy Science Malaysia in Penang in 1995, but Hubble was launched in 1990. So the moment it was launched, we saw the, the information of Hubble, 91, 92, 93, lah. a lot of information. Oh no, what happened? There was a flaw in the primary mirror immediately when Hubble was launched. And then yeah. we saw in the astronomy magazine, the American astronomy magazine, Sky and Telescope and Astronomy, that each picture that we see, for example, the Whirlpool Galaxy, they have to reprocess it. So I said, what's happening? So much effort. But then Hubble used the space shuttle on the repair mission. So in a sense, the primary mirror got spherical aberration, positive, so many, so much value. They, they, they removed the, uh, what you call, the second mirror of Hubble, which is on the modular design, remove the second mirror and put in a new second mirror, which has negative uh, uh, distortion. So plus and minus become zero. Perfect vision. So Hubble is going on for nearly 30 years and still working. But I've yes. got the Hubble, so I remember the first talk in Penang, we gave in the UC in Penang and in, in the schools in Penang was what? Hubble. And those days, uh, Derek, it was the, those days for internet was not fast. So what we have is we have the 1.4 megabyte floppy disk. I remember oh, yeah, yeah. to fill up the 1.4 mega, uh, megabyte floppy disk, it takes me one week, one week, but it was worth it. Because USM got internet, the school don't have. So we were surviving on Hubble pictures for nearly 15 years. Okay, until wow. about, yeah, yeah, about 2005. Then only we stopped we use other telescopes. So Hubble was a real eye opener for us. We really appreciate Hubble. And now the new uh, one coming in, of course, Hubble is still working. Yes. James Webb, or we call it Webb. So in future, the past we know was Hubble, Hubble. So in future, be Webb, 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 Webb. Always be Webb. Yeah. <laughs> so we, hope, Webb. Uh, <laughs> we hope now, uh, until the launching time, it would be, I use the word nail biting, you know. So please, uh, trim your nails before the 18th of uh, December is long because otherwise <laughs> you can eat up all your nails. It will be nail biting. Yeah. We hope to be yeah. launched successfully and put into the correct orbit, uh, the halo orbit. And after another six months of testing, it's a go. Then yes. the real fun will start. Right. Okay. Yeah. Genuinely. Yes. And and I I, I put this picture up here for it's no coincidence because uh, it's from Arizona State University where I I went to school and uh, I was able to meet the professor that took this photo, Dr. Roger Winhorst. Uh, yeah. Truly amazing. I told him that you know that was one of the most awe inspiring yeah, images yeah. I've ever seen. Truly awesome. Yeah. So uh, and and it's just amazing. I mean, like. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope enabled 15,000 papers <laughs> yes. in peer-reviewed journals, okay? And so it's not even counting conference papers that actually utilize Hubble's data. So that is how much science that came out of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's truly a huge milestone for humanity. But of course, uh, one thing we want to know is that the Hubble Space Telescope operates in uh, UV visible light and near infrared. So this here serves as um, its capability, but also some of its limitation, okay, as we shall see. However, before we run off into James Webb, um, wow. I think one of the mo most awe-inspiring photos ever. Wow. <laughs> this is the one, okay, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field image of space in the constellation of Fornax. Now, the reason I shared this is twofold, one, how great Hubble is. I mean, just zoom into this picture and then look and see how many galaxies are there. And each galaxy has billions of stars. Yeah, we yeah. are just totally tiny in this universe. And, and Hubble is just reminding us of that. And the second point is, of course, now, what can we look forward to with the James Webb? So uh, I think that, yes, nail biting is perfect analogy for what Dr. Chong is saying. 
Um, I'm going to start biting my nails, but maybe I'll cut my fingernails. So, uh, uh, that is, that is, <laughs> and what you, you say just now. So, ah, basically, yeah. uh, well, Harvard Ultra Deep Field is this. If you use a powerful, big, professional object on the Earth, very dark sky, you look at this part where Hubble Ultra Deep Field is, even the powerful telescope on the Earth will see nothing. But Hubble is in space and will observe it for many, many hours. Like some of the Hub Hubble Deep Field took all together 100 hours to image them. So basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. these are galaxies at the edge of the observable universe. About 13.5 mm. billion light years from us. Or mm, yeah. another way is looking into the past 13.5 billion years ago. Hubble, this is stretching the ultimate limit of Hubble. Hubble cannot see more than that, further than that, back in time further. But James Webb can. So James Webb can see further than this, more galaxy. And another one, James Webb can see closer and closer to what? The Big Bang. The Big Bang. Yeah. Can James Webb see the Big Bang? Sorry, we have to wait for another telescope. But James Webb can see further than Hubble, further back into time than Hubble. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And and actually, that's one of uh, Hubble's achievements, right? So it's measuring the Hubble constant using, uh, you know, I mean, it measures these variable stars in the Virgo cluster that kind of determine the distances and and eventually the Hubble constant that defines right. the expansion, which defines the age of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very deep astronomy going on. So, anyways, uh, as Dr. Chong said, we want to move further, or we want to see further. <laughs> so. Uh, back in 1996, okay, there was an idea for this uh, next generation space telescope. And uh, in 2002, they renamed it the James Webb Space Telescope. Who is James Webb? Um, he's NASA's second administrator. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the telescope uh, will have a gold plated beryllium mirror of 6.5 meters, and we will talk a little bit more about it later. And the wavelength of operation 0.6 to 28.3 microns. So uh, 0.6 microns is about orange light, approximately. 0.7 is reddish. So um, we're already towards the longer wavelength of light, and then even longer, all the way into 28.3 microns, which is far into the infrared territory. Okay, and uh, here are the goals. Or JWST, okay, to find uh, light, to search for light from the first stars and galaxies that form in the universe, okay, after the Big Bang. And that's exactly what Dr. Chung is pointing out, that since the JWST can see further, we can see further back in time, literally. Okay, the further you see, the earlier that the galaxy or that galaxy was in the time scale of the universe, and so the uh, James Webb is uh, uh, designed to see that. Um, and also study formation of uh, galaxies, evolution of galaxies, evidently, because you can see so far back. And uh, formation of planetary and star systems, because uh, infrared is a longer wavelength than light. So in simple terms, say that infrared can penetrate dust better than optical uh, frequencies, the light that we see. So the infrared can actually go through the dust and we can see into dust, dusty regions where stars are forming and planets are forming. And uh, we can also study planetary systems therefore and probably the origins of life. Okay, and that's why the JWST is designed to operate in the infrared region. Now, um, there is some infrared uh, uh, images already, okay. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope here took this image of the core of the Orion Nebula. So, um, and of course, it looks less familiar than what we normally see, okay. So, uh, and, and it's because the infrared penetrates down deep into the, the core of uh, the Orion Nebula. Um, the what we normally see in visual is uh, there's like a lot of dust over in this uh, central region right here near the trapezium of stars so um infrared is certainly the way to go for our observation uh derek i'll just add on yes. for a piece of a space telescope uh, yeah, so some, yeah. some of you are watching may be thinking if this is infrared telescope 
Web also infrared telescope. That means what web uh web can do, Spitzer can do. In a sense, it's like that. Both are also infrared, but there's a catch for Spitzer. Spitzer needs cooling. The sensor needs cooling, so you need cryogenic fluid to cool it. And once the cryogenic fluid runs out, Spitzer is dead. Cannot be used anymore. Whereas uh, web is different. James Webb is different. It has this sun shield. We block off the sunlight. So it's called passive cooling, meaning it's in the shadow of the sun shield. So the web particle is always cool to uh, minus 233 degrees Celsius. Of course, yeah, yeah. Kelvin, very cold, all right? And it wouldn't burn it. You don't need any cry cryogenic fuel, uh, uh, coolant. It's always cold, all right? Because if you want to observe, like what uh, uh, Dr. Derek mentioned just now, uh, the universe is infrared. The problem is, if you observe with the uh, Hubble telescope, you cannot. Because the Hubble mirror itself gives off infrared more than the energy of the infrared that mm -hmm. you want to observe. So the in the infrared energy of the mirror will drown out the infrared from the source. So you have to cool the mirror, the 16, uh, 18 segments of the beryllium mirror, so the James Webb, and then only you can detect the infrared. So it is passive cooling. So that's why it's better. In other words, if the system of the sunshade uh, works well, huh, you can use it for many years for the James Webb. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Yeah. Fact. So, so, um, but anyway, the, the point over here is that we want to observe in infrared. So there's already several reasons for it, okay, that uh, we want to see the longer wavelength, it can penetrate dust and you can see further back into time in the universe. Now, uh, what Dr. Chong mentioned about that this, the, the infrared instrumentation has to be cooled uh, very far uh, below zero, about negative 230 uh, Celsius. So um, one of the plan is to position this uh, James Webb Space Telescope not in an orbit around the Earth, because as Dr. Chong points out, the mirror itself would heat up so much that it, it, it emits infrared. So infrared light is emitted by um, any heated object and um, it will overwhelm the sensors. So the James Webb Space Telescope is put kind of further out into space at what we call the Lagrange point, L2, yeah. where there's a stable orbit. Uh, the sun's and, and Earth's uh, gravitation kind of balances out. So it takes minimal energy to remain in place. Okay. And uh, more importantly, it's kind of like further from the Earth so that there's uh, is further away from this source of uh, infrared, <laughs> which is us. <laughs> so um, that's kind of uh, one of the uh, plannings for this JWST to be. Okay, and uh, the infrared sensing, uh, as Dr. Chong points out, has this critical need to be cooled. Um, it was placed into deep space, as mentioned, at the Lagrange L2 point, just far enough into space where it's cold enough, okay, that uh, um, if the sunlight is shielded, uh, instruments can be maintained at a temperature of approximately 50 kelvins or like negative 223 degrees Celsius, which is crazy. And there's no cryogenic cooling needed, as Dr. Chong points out, okay. And uh, how does it work is that there has this, there's this, uh, uh, the bottom side of the spacecraft uh, sorry, of the J James Webb Space Telescope, okay, it's actually a, a, a kind of a umbrella mirror kind of thing, okay, uh, it's a heat shield, okay, uh, whatever we like to call it, and uh, basically what it does is it kind of passively radiates heat that comes from the sun back into outer space, and there are five layers of this heat shield, so um, the sunlight comes in, you know, as you, as you can see in the diagram, Okay, it comes, the first layer kind of guides the, the heat energy and then uh, pushes out through the side, second layer too, third layer, fourth layer, etc. Uh, subsequently. So uh, as a result, very little heat from the sun can pass through this heat shield to the instrumentation. And what's on the other side of, this, uh, of the heat shield? Uh, it's space. Space is literally, you radiate all your energy into space. Uh, so. It is uh, very cold on the side of the telescope mirror and instrumentation down to 15 kelvins or minus 200, uh, 223 
degrees Celsius. So, um, and even in addition, there's uh, more passive cooling systems to cool these infrared instruments even further down to 39K, okay? And it's crazy. Uh, and then yet, there is a cryogenic system on board too that cools yet another sensor or mid-infrared sensor down to seven Kelvin. So just only seven degrees above absolute zero, minus 266 degrees Celsius. Insane. And uh, this is like pretty, some pretty uh, amazing engineering yeah. and science that's happening right here. So, so uh, allow me just to uh, interject a bit. Uh, okay. So okay. In, in, in physics, uh, in science, we say, when you cool down system, what's the whole idea? The whole idea is to reduce the noise. Yes. So there's infrared noise, electrical noise, 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 noise. You cool it in one blow, you reduce all the noise to very low. Of course, the ultimate is what? Absolute zero. If you cool to absolute zero, zero Kelvin, the noise becomes zero, but not easy to achieve, right? Okay. Yes, yes. So, uh, and, and if there are any astrophotographers out there, that's, they, they're certainly yeah. familiar with it, right? Uh, uh, you know, there's all these cool astro cameras out there. But yeah. I, I'm just wondering, you know, like, and I, I haven't checked any details, like at this cold temperature, mm. can they do some superconductivity? Uh, definitely. <laughs> they have a yeah, superconducting because, yeah. circuit. Yeah, because uh, we, have, we now know that high temperature super, superconductors which yeah. becomes super conductive at liquid nitrogen temperature, 77 mm -hmm. degrees Kelvin. So definitely you can. Even the traditional classical superconductor like mercury and so on, mm -hmm. the 7K is very, very low. They also yeah. become superconductor, the traditional one. So it's very cool. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether they actually are using some superconducting technology in there too. Yeah. I'm not very sure, but I know that some of the superconducting devices, for example, the squid, Superconducting yeah. quantum implementation device, huh? yeah. very sensitive to detect very, very weak magnetic field. Oh, so yeah. I don't know whether they are using this, but mm. we know that you reduce the, the temperature, you reduce the noise. So, so in many ways, the whole system becomes very sensitive. And why yes. why good like like what we agree is that passive cooling. So if the sun shield can work for remember the lifetime for for this uh uh, James Webb is 10 years, so it can wait for 30 years, yeah. like Hubble, so you can maintain that total low temperature for 30 years. But there's a problem. Uh, Derek, can you go back to the earlier uh, picture of the, of the telescope, the picture? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one, yeah. One disadvantage of the design, which they cannot do away, the primary mirror is exposed. The mm. micro meteorites from space can hit the mirror and damage it. Whereas the Hubble is in a tube, it's all protected. Only the forward direction, the light going in, the yeah, micro meters can go in, but the rest of it is protected by the tube of Hubble. So this open design, they cannot avoid it because yeah. they have to make a big telescope they can open out. So you we have the big open out, it includes the, the tube like Hubble design, a solid design, then it'd be impossible to send a very big telescope. So they have to have this. So the disadvantage of this is open to the elements. If there's any micro meteorites, it's okay. That means the, the barium, barium meters are very hard slightly damaged, uh, but don't have a big table of meteorite that hit it. Uh. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. but, and, and I think that it can withstand some heat, right? Because yeah. if you look at the observatory mirrors, they tend to be very dusty. People yes, yes, really yes. clean them up and yeah. yet they still operate so well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, maybe some people might be concerned, oh yeah, just one micrometeorite would destroy the whole telescope. No, it won't really because um, the whole surface area that's mm -hmm. capturing the light is still yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, just because, one tiny portion of yeah. it. Yeah, because you see, the uh, micro meteorite not only can damage the middle, can damage the five layers of the cat form poly mm. polymer. Oh, it can yeah, yeah. But because of the layer design, if one uh, micro go through one layer layer, maybe the other parts are still there. Uh, unless you have a big chunk of material to hit and tear through the all the five layers. So the the what do you call the sun shield, uh, the five layers like you mentioned, would be damaged by micro meteorite. But the whole principle will still work. Unless there's a big tear in one of the one of the layers of the sun shield, eh? it's made of capcom. Yeah. I've used it before for my research. Very yeah. interesting, you know. It's a very very high thermal conductivity, but very low electrical conductivity. Uh, that's the purpose. And I think yeah, it's some, like of, capton, some of the layers, huh? capton, of, the, right? uh, some of, the layers of the capton are coated with aluminum also to reflect back the light. 
the other mm. side. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, the that technology that goes in, it's not, it's not like an umbrella. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very expensive umbrella. So maybe, uh, Derek, you, you go on with your picture. Later on, I'll design my picture. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> here are the main instrumentations on a James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. There's a near infrared camera, a near infrared spectrograph, a fine guidance sensor, and near infrared imager and slipless spectrograph. And also a mid infrared instrument, uh, Miri. Okay, so uh, pretty much uh, uh, can the city of Miri in Sarawak sue them for the name? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah, on the right hand side here, we have a diagram that actually kind of shows uh, okay, uh, okay, the visible light is kind of like oh, this tiny little region on the lower left corner right here, and then this is where okay, uh, this uh, <clears throat> FGS NIR Niris. Near spec and near cam, uh, this is where it's uh, sensitive, and then uh, Miri is over here. Okay, so uh, and of course the near infrared is where these guys are operational, and then Miri goes in the mid infrared. Okay, so uh, and of course uh, you know this. I mean, this is a very wonderful diagram that I kind of stole from NASA, and I forgot to kind of write the, the website down there, which uh, I should have. Um, but uh, you can, I mean, it's one of, it's, it's in all the instrumentation links that I have, and I'm, you know, starting the next slide. So, uh, but uh, the near infrared can help reveal cool red stars and uh, it's transparent to dust. Okay, so we can literally look through the dust. Uh, in mid infrared, you can see planets, comets, asteroids, and dust warmed by starlight, protoplanetary disks. So uh, these are all like uh, for studying like these uh, uh, new, newly uh, formed uh, planetary systems and stars. So um, that's kind of uh, exactly what we mentioned earlier, okay? So uh, a little bit about the near cam. So, okay, uh, we, we, we saw that it covers like about 0.6 to 5 microns. So kind of orange color light into uh, the shorter wavelength of infrared, okay? And uh, not only does it uh, look through the dust and all, all, all those stuff, uh, it also, uh, we can look, well, it looks through all the dust, but we can look at it in the nearby galaxies, as well as the Milky Way, and even uh, Kuiper Belt objects that are just at the fringe of our solar system to uh, look at uh, the, the formation and, and whatever objects out there. Uh, Dr. Chong, any, any, anything to add on this? Yeah. So can you go back to the earlier picture, the infrared wavelength? Yes. I like the picture. Okay, this one. Huh? Yes. So... How do you explain this in plain language? I can think, I think of it this way, yeah. So we know that Hubble can see what see the universe invisible light. So for human beings, you use your eyes, no? but you use spectacle is a lot right? to see the stars, see the Milky Way, see all the the, the edge of the invisible light. Right? But what about James Webb or Webb? Webb doesn't see because this infrared is what heat. So I see James Webb. I use a common word, a word feel the heat from the universe it doesn't see the universe because this is beyond our eyes uh, uh, uh response it feels the heat from the and it's very very big so in other words, there's a heat on your skin and you feel the heat now so that is what james but is doing and this is very very fundamental but what uh, derek mentioned this now in private light has much longer wavelength so as the wavelength passes through some of the dust in between the galaxies and so on you just pass through them as if the dust clouds are not there. Whereas the visible yeah. light seen by Hubble will be blocked by the by the dust cloud in between. But Hub that James Webb, no problem. The light from the edge of the universe passes through so many of the dust clouds will reach us. So James Webb yes. feels the heat. Okay. Yeah, and but then then I, I think that uh, in the audience maybe someone will have a question like why why can't we put this telescope on the ground? Why it has to be in space? Yeah. So uh, first of all, we know that on the on the Earth, you everywhere you go, there's a lot of light pollution and so on, right? And there's a big problem for infrared. What? Water vapor. It's too old. It's a big absorber of wavelength of infrared. Carbon dioxide. All right. If you have a thick layer of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, what we absorb, but luckily carbon dioxide not so much. Water vapor. So most of the water we, the water will absorb most of the infrared. That's why they say that one advantage, actually, 
it probably as well can be done on top of mountain top like take back telescope one and two all the big on the mountain top there's they can detect some infrared they bring so they can do that but then some of the higher than the very high height right, still got water vapor still absorb it so that's why so it needs to go into space you see yeah yes so and that's why uh the james webb will be revolutionary in a way uh, of course the spitzer has the infrared sensor already yeah. but now the james webb will be even better so um this uh near cam uh it has some it has one very cool feature and that's called a coronagraph that what does it you know, maybe there's some uh ob interesting object next to a very bright star or something and this chronograph uh, it will be used to block out the, the scattering the, the 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 light kind of shining from, to the side from the bright stars so kind of block it out block the interference and then you can see objects very close to all these brighter stars so that's kind of uh what's interesting about this near infrared camera yeah. okay and then uh, there's a near infrared spectrograph Okay, uh, operates in the same wavelength, so same colors that you see and the same heat, okay, um, as Dr. Chong uh, puts it. Okay, um, but <clears throat> the spectrograph, what it does is, uh, just as Isaac Newton took the prism and broke white light into the rainbow colors, um, this spectrograph takes all these uh, light from 0.6 microns to 5 microns in wave and breaks it up, okay? Uh, so it separates it out, okay, this light at uh, 0.6 microns, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, uh, 1, 1.1, blah, 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 all the way to 5 microns and separates it out. And then what, what it does is it so, uh, it so happens that atoms, molecules in space, they all have a signature, okay? that is specific at uh, these uh, different wavelengths. So the spectrograph can kind of identify compositions of matter that is in space. But not only that, it can also determine the temperature and even mass, okay, of, uh, of, of these objects, okay, because mass, I'm, I'm guessing probably uh, due to uh, this uh, gravitational redshift and things like that. So, um, it is a very powerful tool that operates in a near infrared spectrum. Uh, that's now that's that's going to be on board in the that is on board in, in the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, wait a minute, uh, uh, Daddy, you go back yes. to spectrograph. Very yes. interesting. Uh -huh. So we know that in astronomy, uh, we are amateurs, lah. But if you know a bit more technical information, the bread and butter uh, topics in astronomy number one is spectroscopy, like now. You split the wavelength of light, which is not only visible light by infrared, whatever actually gamma, into the component that is called spectroscopy. The other one is called photometry. Photometry means brightness. Mm -hmm. So measure the spectrum, measure the brightness. That is astronomy. Now coming back to this, there's uh, like why you mentioned the star red shift. That is the reason they use for James Webb infrared spectrograph because many of the uh, galaxies we know, uh, which are close to our galaxy. They will move away from the Earth according to Hubble's law with a slow recession velocity. So the red shift will be. But James Webb is what? James Webb is actually a cosmological telescope. Big. Mm. Right to the edge of the universe. Origin of the Big Bang. All are extreme. So the, the James Webb is looking at those at the edge of the universe. So if you have a galaxy emitting light, if you are close to the galaxy, it's still in the visible region. But at the edge of the union, they have been very shifted into the infrared and beyond. Yes. So those yes. type, uh, those type of galaxy on the Earth you cannot see. So only James Webb can see. They are very shifted to such a big factor that they come into the infrared. That's why they use it, infrared spectrogram. Okay. Yes. Yes. And by the way, uh, I'd like to comment that uh, if any one of you are out there listening, uh, if you have any questions for. Dr. Chong or myself, you can post them in the comment section below, uh, either on YouTube or on Facebook. And uh, once we see the questions, we'll help answering. Uh, Derek, so, I just add, I just add yes. one more comment. Yes, yes. We have here in a web map, four important camera, including a spectrograph. Mm -hmm. We know that in all the space mission launched by NASA, every single equipment we have a uh, group. So it's not one professor in a UNC in America doing it could be one principal investigator, a professor, well-known professor, with a big group of people. And we know that it's an international collaboration. NASA, right. America, 
ISA, European Space Agency, or the European country, Canada Space Agency, and the whole world. So basically, each of these equipment here is run by a group headed by a principal investigator. But the result mm -hmm. of this, this particular spectrograph camera will be used by researchers around the world. Around the world, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but you, your your point brings up an interesting question. You know, do we know any Malaysians working on the James Webb Space Telescope? Ah, that's it. That's it. I, I just add on that we are part of that. Even a year ago, the mm -hmm. the proposals for James Webb Space Telescope, which I call Webb now, we must get used to do it. Web, web, web. Web. About a year ago, it's about thousand two hundred proposals around the world have been sent mm -hmm. to the STSCI. What's the STSCI? Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh huh. The same institute that runs the Hubble will be running James yeah. Webb, right? So they yes. have they have received thousand two hundred proposals, of which two hundred and sixty six have been approved. Definitely from America, Europe, Japan, and around the world. Like you mentioned, I cannot I cannot answer you. Anyone from, from USM from Penang, I don't think so. From Malaysia, I also don't know lah. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe well, I mean, like some Malaysian astronomy professors, like overseas or something. Could be, Maybe could be. Someone, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. in a team. In a, uh, in a team. I think it'll be certainly interesting to know someone who actually probably you have worked on this project or something. Yes, yeah, sure. you know, because it doesn't have to be astronomy, right? The engineers uh, that yeah. work on this thing. Yeah. Uh, certainly. I think so. That is that I would say definitely some Malaysian is involved in some aspect yeah. of the James Webb Space Telescope, right? And including the 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 what what is related to it? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Great. So um, the next instrument is called a fine guidance sensor. So uh, basically, the fine guidance sensor is kind of a sort of a helper to kind of point the telescope. So if you are an astrophotographer, it's basically that guide scope. <laughs> so um, the web has it too okay yeah. so uh, you know if, if some 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 people may think ah yeah <laughs> this telescope doesn't have a guide scope <laughs> my telescope at home is better <laughs> no it does and it's a very good one so you know uh and and there's also a slitless spectrograph imager and slitless spectrograph okay so uh, again for exoplanet detection and exoplanet transit spectroscopy okay uh it's it's a bit more difficult of a term for me, <laughs> Doctor Chong. Do you want? Yeah, to one more thing is yeah, we must add on, of course, right from the beginning, the price tag. So, what is the price tag of the of the James Space Space Telescope? I think they don't include the Ariane rocket, only James Webb. Right? Listen carefully, ten billion USD. B for Bangkok, huge. <laughs> one followed by ten euros, US dollar, huge. But the original, uh, what you call budget, huh? When James Webb was announced, like you say, 1996, next generation grid, grid, grid telescope, the, uh, the proposed budget was about 5.1 billion USD. But now it's doubled to 10 billion. So no joke. 10 yeah. billion dollars, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for any engineering project, and I think that project managers out there or, or you know, yeah, yeah. leads, uh, they, they would know that, you know, budgets usually run astray and so yeah this is again another classic case of it of course right. the other one uh like yes. what, what uh dr Derek lim mentioned just now if you send into the l2 lagrangian uh orbit which is 1.5 million kilometers from earth which is about four times further than the moon so at that distance mm -hmm. from the earth nowhere you can have a repair mission for web that is going nowhere not like mm -hmm. hubble Many yeah. repair mission, modular design, pull up one module and plug in a, a good module. So no, so it must open perfectly and work perfectly. Anything goes wrong, they cannot do anything to it. Especially they say, when you open up the, the petal uh, for the primary mirror, the 18 segment, and open up the, the three, uh, the four struts that deploy the secondary mirror. Very, so mm. many important steps along the way. Everything must work. That's why I said it's going to be for many of the, the people in the in the, the, the research world and the, the engineers in the James Webb nail biting, right? They have been <laughs> spending 20 years on it, 25 years on it. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is amazing technology. And yeah, as you go into space, it's like everything must work perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no room for error. Yeah, yeah. So wow.
so we come to MIRI, okay, the mid infrared instrument. Uh, and this, of course, see even longer wavelength, and of course, then requires even more cooling because a little bit noise, so shorter wave, longer wavelength will have less energy. So uh, the noise energy, less, a lower noise energy can affect the sensor yeah. more. So you got to cool it even more to kind of make the energy even lower so that the signal is clear as uh, Dr. Chong pointed out earlier. So that's what's uh, on board the, G uh, the, the James Webb, okay? Um, and it'll be, I mean, I, I totally look forward to what can this uh, this instrument detect, okay? I mean, distant galaxies, newly forming stars, faintly visible comets, okay, are the Cuba belt objects. Um, yes, yeah, and and yeah, Dr. Dr. Chong, yeah, and of course, of course, <laughs> we have been seeing this in, in the news, not uh, only in the in the public news, the newspaper, TV station, America around the world. But even by serious researchers for many years, they said that if James Webb will perform according to its specification, they, they will have the discoveries by James Webb will rewrite the textbooks. Many mm -hmm. of the textbook information, like the Big Bang, Exoplanet, they talk like that because the telescope was so powerful. Now with James Webb, the discovery by James Webb will overthrow a lot of previous theory or come up with new information. They will have to rewrite it. So, so this is very, very great, very fundamental. So it'd be very nice to, to, to become a astronomy major in a college in the world, you know, uh, uh, Delhi. Take astronomy. Yeah, yeah. Because as you are doing astronomy, hey, the professor said, boys and girls, have you seen what happened last week? James Webb discovered this thing, no. So that means the, 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 the professor or the lecturer teaching astronomy course had to keep up with the latest discovery of James Webb. Yeah. Right. I'm you keep on talking about this for one more year, the student following is called, hey, boring, man. We already know the new discovery. Why you talk of the old one? You will rewrite the textbook, you know. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So so I'm 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 still young. I can probably go for a second PhD in astronomy. Yeah, I... yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> good, good uh, very good. Yeah. If my brain can handle it. <laughs> okay. But anyways, uh, so those are the instrumentation on the James Webb Space Telescope. So now let's turn around to look at the mirror. Okay, the, the cow. Uh, for, for a lot of amateur astronomers, the sexy part of the telescope, ah, the mirror. Okay, and, and the Hubble primary mirror is only 2.4, only, and that's already huge, 2.4 meters. It's so so a, a, a person on average is about, you know, 1.7 meters. Okay. Uh, you stand up straight and you're not even as big as the mirror, as the mirror's diameter. So for that, and that's Hubble, okay, 2.4 meters, maybe uh, Yao Ming, <laughs> the, the, the finest basketball player. Okay, or it's probably a bit taller. Than... Of course, in astronomy, well, you know, in astronomy, we, we don't say that, oh, uh, web is 6.5 meter, Hubble 2.4, so 6.5 divided by 2.4. No, 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 it's no. the area yeah. that counts. So the yes. area is 6.5 divided by 2.4 and the whole answer squared. So the yes. light colliding power of web is more than the Hubble many times. Yes, right? it's more than just the diameter yeah, ratio. Yeah. And, and then of course, the other one you see, yeah, you see, Hubble is a single mirror. But web cannot be made into a single mirror because otherwise the tube and the weight of the mirror is so big, you cannot launch into space. So it's called a segmented mirror, 18 hexagonal segment. And each segment is made of thin, uh, uh, what they call blend of beryllium metal, yes. right? Which is polished into a convex shape and coated with gold. And each individual 18 segment can move independently. They are like what Derek mentioned is some uh, actuators behind it. They can make it uh, bend and mesh into one until the whole 18 segment works as a single mirror. And remember, uh, optics uh, in probably is still very short with blank, you know. So in other words. The accuracy of matching all the mirrors moving as one uh, definitely is finer than the thickness of the human hair. Not one easy. for one thousand. Uh, and you have to do it <laughs> in space. Yeah. One point five million humans in space. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So ten ten thousand times smaller than the thickness of the human hair. That's yeah, the yeah, accuracy. Yeah. Okay. But what we'll talk about in, in a bit. Um, what one thing in. Uh, I was, I was trying to bring up uh, something. Oh, the resolution. So 
uh, because this operates in infrared, so the wavelength is a bit longer. So when you have a longer wavelength, the resolution uh, decreases um, as well. So a larger mirror is also necessary to make good resolution for the uh, uh, infrared uh, imaging. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so as mentioned, yes, the, the mirror is uh, gold-plated beryllium. And uh, why, why, why beryllium? Because it is a very strong and light element. And uh, I, I think I read a blurb somewhere that they mine this beryllium somewhere in the United States, in the state of Utah or something like that. Yeah, Utah, uh, yeah. Utah, right? Yeah. yeah. And and um, quite 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 a crazy thing. Yeah. That, uh, there's a very thin layer of gold. And because and gold, why gold? Not because it looks fancy, you know, like your gold watch or anything. No, uh, but because gold is highly reflective in infrared and and that's the main reason so so no vanity no room for vanity here but rather just straight hard whole literally science <laughs> okay so uh and that mirror as dr dr john pointed out many times okay uh there are 18 segments uh and each the, the 18 segments actually are separated into three groups of six of each Okay, uh, each single segment is 20 kilograms. And then uh, these three groups here actually are like, they're kind of like, uh, they have an optical prescription, meaning like there's a, it is like an optical group that, that uh, uh, you can say that it has pretty much the same optical formula. So, so that's kind of how it functions. So, so that's kind of uh, how, how the whole um, um, mirror is divided. Uh, and and you know here here's a picture that shows you all the different segments. <laughs> it's interesting. It's like a family photo of all the mirrors. Uh, and, uh, I just yeah. want to add on, uh, Derek. Uh, again, I want to yeah. ask, what is the price of the mirror? So beryllium is not cheap, you know. Beryllium market yeah. price is now one gram, fifteen USD. One gram. Uh, one 60, gram. One gram. Sixty ringgit. Six zero ringgit. So now show me eighteen segment. How many? A bit. But they reduce the cost one. The uh, 18 segment, each segment is actually a honeycomb design. It's not a single solid, of course, it's very thin, not so thick like the other big mirror. But then they put honeycomb design, they throw away a lot of the mess. So mm -hmm. only the top layer is where you polish, grind, and polish it. But even then, the total weight is quite, quite high. One gram, 15 USD. So expensive. And sorry, yeah. uh, Derek, I checked already in the periodic table. Uh, our beryllium is a toxic element. So if you are spray in the form of a gas or fluid or solution, long exposure is carcinogenic. Whereas glass, yeah. metal is safe. So beryllium it is a toxic material if you don't use it properly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's interesting to know. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of the you know, and and we already see how crazy. <laughs> Yeah, things get and and here's something even more crazier. Yeah, actuation. Okay, as, as again that that uh, Dr. Chong pointed out in terms of focusing. So so as 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 Dr. Chong mentioned earlier, all the mirrors work in tandem in kind of like those three separate groups yeah. A, B, and C, um, all in tandem to precisely focus the light to the sensor and how accurate thinner than the, than the thickness of a human hair by how much one ten thousandth yeah. <laughs> the thickness of a human hair yeah. so wow that's just totally mind-blowing right yeah and uh the, 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 there are six actuators in the in the in the secondary oh wait let's see yeah. primary mirror segments and secondary mirror segments okay they have six actuators and there are additional actuators on each individual segment yeah to control the curvature of the Segment. So it, it's just like totally mind blowing all the engineering that went into this uh, telescope. Uh, truly a pinnacle of human achievement. Now, this is a very important picture. I like it. Wow! 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 Yes. <laughs> and so yes, this one is the one of the you know uh, relief from the nail biting moments. Okay. <laughs> so the 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 trip uh, the James Webb Telescope took now down to Guiana Space Center in French Guiana. Okay, and it's arrived on October 12, 2021.
Okay, and and, and Dr. Chong, you you, uh, th this is not the end of the presentation. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just add on to some of the slides. Yeah. I'll add on. Yeah, yeah. I just add on. Yeah, to I'll just cycle through it and then I'll let you add on, maybe. Okay, uh, I'll just, talk, talk about just add on to about this slide of yours. So right now, okay. as arrived in the in the Kuru Regional Space Center, owned by the European Space Agency, but the American choose to launch it from from the from the European Space uh, Spaceport, which is in Kuru, Plan Vienna, not in Cape Kennedy Space Center. I don't know why. Maybe uh, so. Do we. So right now, where is the James Webb? It will not be on the launch pad. It now must be put into one of the big room or laboratory where they are doing final checking and testing, mm -hmm. and they integrate it into the payload of the Ariane 5 rocket, the payload. And remember, they cannot unfold all the petals, the prime mirror. They have to fold it so it can fit in snugly into the payload uh, area of the thing. So all this will take time. Two months from now, only once, you know. And then two months, so they'll be very busy. So who will be busy? The, the te technicians from our two American companies, Northrop Grumman and Ball Aerospace Company. Now, by the way, we always know that the Hubble Space, Ball Telescope, Aerospace. Okay. Hubble Space Telescope was built by Defense Company. Mm. James Webb also built by Defense Company. Northrop Grumman built all the fighter jet and so on, and also yeah. aerospace and Ball. So the technician and the staff from these two companies and other researchers are now there in the laboratory inside uh what is called the space center in guyana yeah yeah wow. it'll so, be pretty awesome to be part of this team but right now i guess they're having sleepless nights yeah yeah yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everything is like yeah yeah, yeah yeah wow just yeah. imagine that yeah so um and then of course dr chong you you also uh, elaborate about a bit more about this you know the deployment timeline for the james webb space telescope okay i have to leave the earth uh, they it'll separate from the main rocket and and etc i'll i'll let you okay. i'll let you talk yeah. more about it. Yeah. so i'll just get on the slide I will, I will share my slide now all right okay huh? yes yes thank I'll you start. derek okay huh? yeah okay or maybe i just share my window a window sorry sorry yeah yeah and just share, I the, share the whole window, window. Yeah. yeah then Okay, can you see my PowerPoint, uh, Derek? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah? so I, I, I just got so some of them is a kind of repeat of what uh, Dr. Derek Lim mentioned, but I'll run over them fast, okay? So, then mm -hmm. take telescope, there you are. So, ladies and gentlemen, get used to this picture. So, slowly, may hopefully, uh, it will be deployed successfully, maybe Derek, within two, three years, sir, everyone will forget about Hubble Space Telescope and they remember only where. So, this is it. So it will be launched yeah. in December, about two months from to, to, today. So it's James Webb, JWST, or Webb Space Telescope. Now we call it Webb. I would like to call it Webb. Uh, what Derek mentioned, the second NASA administrator. Of course, recently, like what we discussed earlier, not, not on uh, this program, the Derek and us, that there's some problem of issue of the name, so of the James Webb. But NASA has announced that they will maintain the name. It will be called James Webb Space Telescope, all right? So it's run by NASA, America, ESA, the European Agency, and of course the Canada Space Agency. But these are the main organizations. Of course, the other smaller uh, other countries, the researchers institute, I'm sure hundreds of universities, research institutes are involved. And of course, don't forget the STSCI, all right? Space Science Institute is the one that actually running it. Where it is? A university of uh, John Hopkins University, mm, yeah, yeah. Space Technical Science Institute. It's a university near to in Baltimore, near to DC, near to uh, uh, Washington DC. So they are going to run it, all right? So that means you want to write any proposal, you have to send to the STSCI to be approved to do the to use the James Webb Telescope. So this is what you see in the in the in the what we call the NASA laboratory, all right? You can see the uh, the right now only the central sixteen uh, segments open. The, the the right side the petal and the left side open and then you can see the five uh what we call uh layers okay very thin layer of uh kaplan film right so they have to also up so the the telescope is all close like that and the the what we call sun sheet is all packed tightly so only in space one yeah. by one the sun sheet will be pulled out to be fully deployed so not easy you know so many parts are moving there not easy 
Right? So $10 billion dollars by the nation. So this is a picture yeah. compared to, oh, okay. this was actually taken <laughs> many years ago, more than 10 years ago. Five, yeah. Yeah. So Five. in other words, yeah. So the, the sun shield is about uh, 21 meters times 14 meters. Tennis court, mm. the size of a tennis court, all right? So like this, okay. And now there's a right. So this is an Italian ship. It's a roll, roll cargo, uh, cargo ship. Roll on, roll off. So here at the back here, mm. uh, you can see my cursor, uh, 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 Derek. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yes, we yes, can see it. So basically, the, 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 they will, on the land, they will, they will put, push in the James Webb telescope in a container inside the hole. Around, now this one is arrived in Kuru, in, in uh, French Guiana, right? It arrived on, on Tuesday, 12th of, of October, on a 16-day journey from Los Angeles, right? So arrived in Kuru, French Guiana. So that's it. So it stopped here. And then right now, of course, the... James Webb must have, in one of these containers must be now put in one of the big, uh, what do you call, assembly area in the space center. Okay, so that's it. So Guiana Space Center. Of course, this is also part of France, you know. So, so it's Sans Spatial Guiana, right? So this is the, in, in France. Uh, so this is a spaceport of, uh, what do you call, ESA. You know, is this something you call it Ariane Space, right? The rocket they use is Ariane 5, the most powerful rocket of ESA. Okay, so where is So now you see, uh, you see on top here, French Guiana. It's a small country, but I would say that it is slightly smaller than Peninsula Malaysia. No, so quite big also, no? So now it's here. And of course, the neighboring is Suriname, belonging to Holland. It's part of uh, Holland. And British Guiana, of course, is, is uh, Britain. Of course, on, the, on the neighbor is, of course, Venezuela and Brazil. Okay. So how now it so on the 26th of September it left the Los Angeles all right on a on a ship and it traveled about it traveled down here passed by Mexico and then passed by all the countries on the Pacific Ocean eh? and then passed through the Panama Canal into the Atlantic Ocean and voila then into this uh, Guiana right nine thousand kilometer journey see so they didn't announce the itinerary correct. Uh, uh, openly, they scared that we had pilots attack it, <laughs> and they were worried that it was a hurricane season. So luckily, everyone keep a sigh of relief. They arrived in Kuru safely, right? So right now, uh, it I was, wonder they, whether they they have any like fighter jets escorting it. Uh, could be, you <laughs> never know. Uh, uh, they were worried about pilots, you know. So this was yeah. in the uh, in the North North uh, uh, lab in the which is. Okay, of course, they have uh, division all America, but this is in their lab in Los Angeles, in Redondo Beach, Los Angeles. So this is uh, before they pack in, all right, Los Angeles. And then now after they, they put in already the, the telescope, all right, everything into a into a container and container put into a kind of this uh, uh, hole here. And then there the telescope inside there and the big truck will pull it up from the Redondo Beach. Brahman, not what government, uh, what they call division, all right? And it took not on the harbor of Los Angeles, which is, I think, Long Beach. No, he went to a place called, called Seal Beach, south of Los Angeles. And then there you have this cargo ship, row, row car, uh, cargo, cargo ship for Italy, ready, all right? So now this uh, lorry will push it into a barge. It, it doesn't push straight into the ship, you know, but the ship is quite high. The, the container with the telescope put into a bus, uh, onto a container, we put onto a bus. And then the bus will have a tugboat to push it next to the cargo ship. All right? And when you read the cargo ship, the, the this lorry will push the container with the telescope into the holding bay of the cargo ship. All right? There you are. And then went on the 9,000 kilometer journey to French Kuru. And luckily, no pilots, right? So the launch date for the James Webb is 18 December. I'll give you the exact time at the end. So please be patient, the last slide. So the end of the HST era. So why is the web needed? So we mentioned this earlier because uh, this HST can see a lot of things, but can see to the edge of the universe and infrared, right? The web can see. So web can see further than uh, Hubble and also to the Big Bang, right? So uh, this is my experience with the Hubble Space Telescope, which I mentioned earlier. We, we started in Penang, in USM. 
The first talks we gave was pictures from Hubble Space Telescope. And to download in 1995, one floppy disk of 1.4 uh, megabyte, it would take one gig, you know. But it was worth it. A lot of people who saw our talks on Hubble Space Telescope. So this is what uh, Derek showed earlier, all right? Uh, comparing the web and the Hubble. Okay, I don't uh, say more. So Hubble is on ultraviolet, which put in near infrared. Web, Sweden Trap Telescope is from infrared to far infrared, 0.6 to 28 microns, okay? Here, okay, this is a comparison of the size. So we know that 1995, uh, it was given the name new generation, next generation space telescope. But that was actually proposed in 1990, the year that Hubble was launched. They already come up with the idea of a uh, web, all right? So the first proposed launch date was announced in 2007. And again, year by year, delay, cost overrun, and so all kinds of problems. And the, the last delay, uh, Derek, was last year, the Ariane 5 got some issues, vibration issue and they launched. So they have to solve the problem of the Ariane 5. So recently, Ariane 5 launched successfully. One of another mission, send the satellite into space. It worked perfectly. And then it was a go for web. Because Ariane, no problem now. Okay. So mission objective you mentioned, I just uh, put in a different way. So James Webb Space Telescope's primary aim is to shed light on our cosmic origin. It will observe the universe's first galaxy, reveal the birth of stars and planets, and look for exoplanet with the potential for life. So basically, it's two things. It's cosmological problem about the birth of the universe, the big question of the universe, and of course about exoplanet. Why exoplanet? Because now we have discovered, and I just checked just now, until today, eh, they have found 4,862 exoplanets. And yesterday, 15 of October 2021, they discovered three exoplanets. Just yesterday, three, three new exoplanets. So they are now finding uh, there is a new exoplanet like Kacang Kuti. So common. Okay. So now you look at it. Look at the bottom. So James Webb can see the on the left is the present, on the right is the Big Bang. The right is the Big Bang. So Webb can see just until 200 million years after the Big Bang. After the Big Bang. When the first galaxies and stars just beginning to form. That is the ultra Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The most furthest thing by Hubble was 400 million years after the Big Bang. So in other words, uh, James Webb can see until 200 million light years up, up, up from the Big Bang. That's the advantage. So you may say, but the difference from 200 to about 500 million light years, 300 million light years, not much. But that's, that's important. We must break the barrier. So James Webb will see this. What about can James Webb see further, further, further into the Big Bang? Not possible. Not in the technology of that. All right. So James Webb can see until 200 million years after Big Bang, all right, or 200 million light years from the distance of the Big Bang. So if you look at this case, now earlier in this picture, the left is now, the right is the right is the Big Bang. But this is opposite. The left is the Big Bang, the right is now. So basically, you see. The, you see here, the first the first stars will form about 400 million years. So basically, James Webb can see even further, just after the Dark Ages. So we know from our cosmology that there's a period where when the, when the, when the Big Bang occurred, inflation occurred, the energy became atoms and so on, hydrogen and so on. But the, before the first generation stars and galaxies formed. So the universe after Big Bang became dark, Dark Ages. So sorry, ladies and gentlemen, James Webb cannot see the Dark Ages. He can see just after the Dark Ages. So James Webb cannot see the Dark Ages. So in future, we hope they will build telescope, can see the Dark Ages, and can see the Big Bang. If they can build a telescope, can see the Big Bang means what? Then man will be able to see the moment of creation. Wow, wow, wow. But now, that will be see just when the first stars and galaxies just form. So that is the, that is the mission objective of uh, web, huh? first generation stars and galaxies. Okay, so this is the web I don't need to go to. So basically, the design is a cost telescope. Of course, you heard of Newtonian, Gregorian, all types of telescope, but this is a special design called cost telescope, where all types of ablation is reduced. So 6.5 uh, meter per meter in 18 concave segment. Each segment is about 1.3 meters in, in diameter. And the secondary mirror is 0 0.7 meter. Uh, second mirror, 
And there's also a tertiary needle. There are three optical needles. And all the needles are made of beryllium. Right? So the focal length is long. Focal length of the effective focal length is of F16. Right? Uh, no, the F number is F16. Focal length is about 131 meters. Right? So after polishing the needles, these are coated with a layer, thin layer of gold, like what Derek mentioned is good reflector of infrared energy. All right? And it comes with a sun shield, the size of a telescope. And the needles operate at about, the, sorry, there's a mistake here, minus 233 degrees Celsius, very cold, passive cooling. But the advantage of the James Webb is lighter than Hubble. James Webb is about 6,500 uh, kilograms or six and a half tons. Hubble is double the mass. Hubble is about 12 tons, you know. All right? So that's why uh, it's easier to launch James Webb because it's lighter than Hubble. All right? Remember they say the Hubble is like a school bus, you know, the volume like school bus. So why beryllium needles? So this is a sample of pure beryllium, looks metallic. So beryllium yeah. is very hard, all right? And beryllium, uh, what do you call, uh, doesn't expand much. And at very low temperature, it will maintain its shape very well. But glass cannot. At very low temperature, glass become brittle, can crack and break, right? So it must be made of metal, so they find that beryllium is the best. And I'm going to coat it with a layer of, of this gold, all right? So now this is after coating for one of the segments in the coating unit. So it's coated in, each individual segment is coated in the vacuum coating unit, and later on, all the 18 segments were coated. Secondary needle also coated, all right, beryllium. Tertiary needle also coated, beryllium, okay? Now this is the back of one of the segments. You see carefully, this is what honeycomb structure. So originally the thickness of each of the of the what they call segment is very thick. I don't know, maybe a few inches, but they will use a kind of machine to machine. So the actual part that hold the the layer of gold is very thin. So by throwing away the mass, the majority part of the of the beryllium. So the the total weight of the this single single segment is reduced about twenty kg. Otherwise, if you put to include all the other parts, it could be 100 kg. So this is called honeycomb structure. So they tried this uh, technique for many of the big telescopes. One of the famous one is our Hail telescope in Mount Paloma. The glass is a honeycomb structure that reduces the weight a lot, okay? So there you are, like what they say, behind each of the segments, you have this control actuator, right? They can make individual of a uh, segment move in such a way that the funny effect that all the mirror will work as if it's a single concave primary mirror, all right? Like this. So this is it. So this is all folded up just before they send into Diana. So I show now how it's unfurled. Huh? So the six, the uh, the twelve segments in the center is, is in one piece. Then the right side, the three three uh, segments will open up like this, and the left side, the other three segments open. So finally, all the eighteen segments are opened up. All right. So these are the instruments which uh, Derek mentioned just now, all right? And that will be placed in the Sun Earth L2 Lagrangian point, all right? So this is sorry, a bit technical, but we have to understand that remember Hubble is not sent into the Lagrangian point, just around Earth of it. But for example, some of the telescopes like uh, WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave, and as a Soviet probe, the cosmic uh, background, uh, what do you call uh, telescope, sent into the L2 Lagrangian point. And the Planck telescope, like one point, right? So this is so what is it? So because of these two science mathematician, Leonard Euler from Switzerland, but work in Russia, uh Joseph Lee Lagrange, originally for Italy, but work in France. They are the one who came up with the idea of the Lagrangian point. These are two famous mathematicians. Both of them are very good. But the, the one on the left is fantastic. He's the most prolific mathematician that I believe, Euler, Leonard Euler. All right, famous, huh? So basically. You are looking here at the potential energy line of the Earth in the, in the uh, Sun in the center, the Earth on the right, right? So of course, orbiting the Earth is the Moon. So imagine you have the, the Sun or gravity, Earth got gravity, Moon got gravity, but you look at the Sun and the Earth. So these are the potential energy line. So these are the equal potential energy line. So now we will plot the uh, this EP potential energy line come from where? Einstein? No. Uh, Newton, law of gravity. When the law of gravity, I mean, here all along this line here circle, the strength of gravity is even. But as you go up, because you are going further away from the sun, so the strength of gravity decreases. Further away decreases. So, you know what? 
the closer the lines are, all right, the force of gravity is stronger. So when the lines are closer, so the, the gravity is always perpendicular, the line will go towards the sun. But here, just open up. The, the, yeah, the, slope, the slope is steeper, right? When the yeah, line is like the, looking at the topological yeah, yeah. map. Yes. Yeah. So the gradient, the gradient of the potential line will give you the strength okay. of the gravity force. So here, like you mentioned, they are very close, steep gradient. The gravity force is great, but here it's open. So this is the what stable point. The stable point what? I repeat, sun in the center, earth here on the right. So between the sun and the earth, there's L1, like question point. Further away from the earth, there's L2, where web will be placed. And on the other side of the sun is L3, and it's L4, L5. But actually L4 and L5, are very stable. So if you put a uh, web there, very good, all right, it will not dip, all right? But basically, they found out that four and five, L4, L4 are very stable, but L1, L2, L3 are not stable. They use the word semi-stable. So you need to have a bit of station keeping. That means now on L2, you put in the web telescope. So in the in the web telescope, there are two sets of mini thrusters. Rockets, not rocket. But the rocket don't use that much fuel. So from time to time, you need station keeping. So let's say if they put in L2 after some, some months, the position of web will drift too far away. Then they'll fire the small thruster to bring it back into position. Right? So but but then why don't we put in L4? Very stable, you don't need any station keeping. L4, you look carefully. Now this blue circle is the orbit of the earth around the sun. Now you put it in L4, L4 is about 157 kilometers, a uh, million kilometers from the earth, about one astronomical unit, too far, too far from the earth. So they have no choice, but they put it in L2. All right. And another one, like this, this is a uh, yeah, this, picture can of I the. Add that, yeah, can, can I add in, that there needs to be the consideration of the communication system, right? Yes. Because it's not about like walkie talkie with, okay, Wi Fi, no. It's like the signal would. What, the signal takes one second to reach the moon, 1.3 seconds, right? Light yeah. takes about 1.3 seconds to reach the moon. So now the Lagrange point L2 is actually uh, how, how many times further again? The like Lagrange point is 1.5 kilometers, million kilometers from the Earth or four moon uh, distance away. Right? Ah, four, now, four, now let's four, go back again. Uh, I, 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 yeah. important point. You remind me of something. Now, yeah, why L4 don't they, eight minutes, uh. Yeah, why don't they put the the web telescope orbiting around the earth the problem is wow. any telescope around the earth including hubble's telescope in the earth shadow in half an orbit and then in the sun half an orbit in a shadow that means that the telescope optics will cool down in the shadow and heat up and cool down you cannot whereas the m2 is always in the sunlight it will not cool it will never enter the earth shadow they have no choice but to put it here all right so that's why they put in l2 all right okay so now this is a potential well of course the sun is a big, deeper potential well and uh, of course if this is a black hole the potential well will go down to infinity but for the sun it won't go down it go down until you hit, hit a certain bottom there that is the where the sun is okay so now we talk about what you mentioned just now the 30 days of terror now we already heard that when the americans launched the the what they call the curiosity rover some years ago and the perseverance rover recently and the china chamber one rover they enter the the martian atmosphere to land on the surface of mars it's the seven minutes of terror but for that will be 30 days of terror that is the earth and now l2 lagrangian point 1.5 million kilometers away from the earth and very close to earth here is what the moon the moon is very near very near very far away from the moon and not only around the moon it'll be into a halo orbit around the moon Oh, no, around uh, halo orbit around the Lagrange L2 Lagrange, Lagrange point. Remember, 2019, China launched their Chang Er four mission to land on the far side of the moon. Their problem was if you're on the far side of the moon, you cannot transmit radio back to the Earth. So to solve the problem, the China Space Agency launched the Che Chiao, the Magpie relay satellite, into the halo orbit of around the moon. Like the L2 point, but not for the, this L2 point I'm showing here is the L2 point for the Sun-Earth system. But the Chang'e 4 is, you send the Churchill relay satellite into the L2 point of the Earth-Moon system. So in that case, the the, the relay satellite Churchill 
of each uh, uh, on on uh, called around the moon, which is always visible to the far side of the moon. So the Chang'e four on the far side of the moon can relay its information to the Churchill relay satellite back to the Earth. But this one is the uh, halo orbit of where uh, on the M two sun diverging point, and it's not only go here, but it will go here like kind of kind of halo. So if you repeat the pattern on and on, I don't know, Derek, in our our mathematics class in the electronics experiment, it's called the Lissajo figure, you know, uh, when the when you have an object which is twice the frequency of the first uh, uh, source, then you form a Lissajo figure. If the second source has tripled the frequency, the fre they will come closer together, Lissajo figure. So basically, it's in the form of Lissajo figure. All right, and of course. The Earth and the Moon and the L2 system will orbit around the Sun. So basically, from the Earth, there will go many, many important steps. So the first is solar array deployment, then communication antenna deployment. All right. Very important is the Sun Shield. So the Sun Shield is layer by the layer, all the five layers will be pulled out. All right. Many hundreds of actually will pull them out. And then later on, only important one is second mirror will deploy. All right and primary mirror. So all these must work well. So from the Earth to, to reach the L2 Lagrangian point, 30 days. So they call it the 30 days of error, uh, of terror. So uh, Derek, uh, someone is, is uh, always uh, uh, very tense. They, they have this, uh, what they call nail biter. The person needs to have very long nails, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So now, this is now, it's in Ariane. This is not where, where this is the early Ariane launch. Huh? Because right now, I'm very sure, the Ariane 5 rocket is still not on the launch pad, all right? It's on the EL3 launch pad in the Kuru Space Center. But this is another Ariane space uh, 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 rocket. And then in the in the payload area is where, you see all snugly inside, all packed, all folded like this, all right? Uh, James Webb. And these are the three organizations, ESA, NASA, and CSA. So this is, imagine, so this web, ESA, Arian space, ESA, right? And he, there you are, this is how it looks like that, right? So when it's launched, when you leave the, the Earth surface, the, the two fairing will fall away and will expose the web, right? So Arian 5 will launch like this, huh? all right? Like this. And remember, why 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 they choose the Kuru? Because Kuru's latitude is 5 degrees north. Same as Pulau Pinang, Penang. Why? The closer you are to the equator, you take advantage of the Earth's rotational speed. Now remember, if you are in Penang, eh, very close to the equator, you are traveling towards the right, uh, towards the east, due to the Earth's rotation at 1,670 kilometers per hour. Faster than the speed of sound, you know? So you have that free energy. If you launch in uh, Guyana, it's of, of the same speed, but you launch from Cape Kennedy, it's slower. So the rotational energy in Guyana, compared to Cape Kennedy, Guyana, has an advantage of about 200, 200 kilometers per hour. You may say, that's a small speed. No, that's a lot. 200 kilometers per hour uh, difference, you add on to the, the, the weight of the whole rocket is significant, right? So you launch from uh, Kuru, Guyana, is easier because you have free energy, the Earth's rotation, all right? So after enters the, leave the Earth's atmosphere, the two pairing will fall out, exposing the web, all right? And then it looks like that. Of course, this one, the, 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 the booster rocket will follow already. And then the web will detach from the first stage of the rocket. And then web will detach from this, this uh, what they call a ring here. And then slowly important, solar, solar panel will open. I don't want to show the your YouTube video because it's longer. So this is the solar uh, panel open. And then this part that will hold, will hold the uh, five uh, sun shield will open also like this. I did, uh, there you are, the actual thing, pulling out one of the sun shape, all right? Very thin layer, all right? Thinner than the human hair. The size of a tennis court. One side only open, the five layers open on the right side. Then they open on the left side. More and more open, so finally five layers open and this. But the primary, uh, the second mirror not yet fully deployed. Eh? Then you see the prim uh, primary mirror will finally deployed like that, so like this. So at the bottom here, facing the sun, very, very, very hot. And here in the in the shade of the sun shield, minus 233 degrees Kelvin, very, very cold. All right. So no, no choice. 
So if there's any kind of a mitral, clade, mitral, mitral, hit the needle, slightly damaged, it's still okay. So this will reach into oblique and put it deployed uh, 30 days after the launch. 30 days, right? So I just... I, 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 I think, uh, Do Dr. Chong, yeah. do you think that we can see this, uh, you know, um, web from the earth? Huh? Yeah, actually... This 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 heat shield is very reflective, maybe right? Uh, actually, yeah, that's right. Uh, the the top three layer, yeah, so... I think you, you see, yeah, uh, the top three layers actually look like metalized. It's actually coated with aluminium. I doubt, I doubt the the brightness of the whole gems web should, should be below the visibility of our say our telescope lah. Say a uh, 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 eight inch eight inch telescope or fourteen inch. So it'd be a good thing we can try, All right? So why not? We, we point, try yeah, and see. be pretty interesting. Yeah, yes. Well, we're, 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 we're getting, we're getting, we're I got web. I got web. Not a web. Once you get web, you take a, a, a time lapse of web. So you can see the web will move in the dark sky and make, make some, some curly, curly, uh, circular motion and something like that. For example, uh, Derek, for years and years, in Sky and Telescope, I've seen reports of amateur astronomers using the amateur telescope able to, to uh, capture those pinpoint lights of the synchronous satellite, the geosynchronous satellite, those like, what do you call this, NASA. You can see the point of light in the dark sky moving. So it's a good thing we can try, you know. I think some of the energies they do, all right? Uh, so we can check what is yeah, the, would be interesting, yeah. what is the apparent magnitude of that? That'd be nice, you know. My might, might dream, not try to capture, right? Yes, sir. So this is exaggerated. So it will not be in the L2 point here, okay? Uh, in the, at the at, on the left side is the sun, then the earth, then build back the moon, and finally it'll be in the halo orbit around here, all right? And then you may say, why not park exactly at L2? There are certain reasons. It must orbit a kind of circular motion here, halo orbit, but this is exaggerated, all right? So that's it. After 30 days, lah, all right, it'll be here. And then, uh oh six months of testing, meaning no more in Kuru. The, the Kuru mission is just to launch it. If launch successful, no problem. So those guys in the in front of their uh, what is called uh, monitor in the Space Science Telescope Institute, all right, in uh, University John Hopkins University, Baltimore, they will be testing, testing, testing all the parts, and only after six months, then what? First light. Already you can see in some of the website, not confirmed. What are the first objects that? James Webb will look at. So we hope that, all right, we'll be successful. So, so, so sorry, uh, 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 Derek, six months of nail biting. <laughs> <laughs> Not 30 days. Yeah, <laughs> then you, you have no more wow. finger. The, your, your finger. Yeah, yeah the, the finger nail is very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> very long nails. Yes, oh my God. Yeah, you have, you have beat through all the nails. So every single uh, part by your nail is all bleeding. Your, the ten fingers will be bleeding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so first object. So we hope, uh, hope, just like you know, uh, 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 Derek, 1990, yeah. we will go to the uh, booksellers in Georgetown selling those astronomy magazines. We're like, what's Hubble? Can work Hubble? Then for about nearly one year, they show picture to Hubble, but no news. No. Then NASA announced there's a flaw in the primary mirror. Oh no! And then they found that. The, the company that grind and polish the needle and tested was Corning Works. Corning is not the company that only make the Corning there in the kitchen. True, but they also make the Hubble telescope. They find that some of the rods uh, that held up the primary mirror of Hubble for testing, there was a mistake in the measurement of the rod. So that's why it was terrible spherical aberration, but it was corrected later. Uh, right? So now uh, we hope that Six months later, so so what? Uh, so, Derek, it will be a long wait, you know. It'll be in June 2022. You know whether it's working or not. June 2022. Then this will announce to the world. They have got the first picture from where? All right, we see what's the picture. All right. So big yeah, discovery. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So of course, there will be big discoveries coming. Just the Hubble. Really, it will be interesting to really look there. Yeah. yeah. So Hubble had made big discoveries, small discovery, all kinds of discovery. So we hope web will work on our country. So the initial lifetime of web should be 10 years. So we hope that we can be a bit more optimistic like Hubble, slightly ex extend beyond 10 years. But even 10 years working is great. So we wait. 
So many of the unanswered big questions in astronomy, especially in cosmology, can be answered by that. And of course, the other more more uh, interesting for the for the layman is got life in the universe, uh, got alien, uh, exoplanet, can be answered by that. All right. So now you come to important A. Now, 18 December Saturday, uh, two months from now, Malaysia, this Malaysian time, 8.45 p.m. to 11.45 p.m. So please prepare, have your dinner early. Get in front of your laptop, yeah. your computer. Pay it probably will, uh, will the Astronomical Society of Penang like host some kind of talk or something? Uh, maybe we can. Uh, uh, there is one, you, maybe we can host it. So the, the live launch. Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, I think that. But that we can, you want to the committee. And the other thing is, uh, 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 Derek, you must prepare for some late, late delay again. There'll be some late delay. So we have to prepare. But yeah, this, it's, it's uh, always happening. Yeah. So this time of 18 December was only announced recently. So mm. prepare 18 December 2021 on a Saturday evening, English Malaysian time. Uh, the time to launch is between 8.45 p.m. to 11 p.m. All right. And of course, the, the important part is that when the when the, the Orient 5 leave the Earth's surface, Kuro, to the part where the pairing, the two pairing open up, exposing the gene track is 30 minutes later. So the first 30 minutes very important. Launching time to 13 minutes, ah, the pairing open, exposing the vectors. That's very important. After that, also important now. But the first 30 minutes is critical. So we hope everything will work according to plan. Okay. So this is the the Aryan Space ERT launch complex. This is where they are going to launch. And this is of course a place where many of the Aryan space rockets will launch. Right? All right? And this is actually uh, Ariane 5 rocket itself. All right. It's in so that means uh, it's in a tropical country where there are a lot of coconut. You look around this space, a lot of coconut trees, you know, and you have a major space port. But this uh Kuru Space Vienna Space Center is unmanned mission they don't launch with human being all unmanned mission all right huh? so remember the timer huh? 18 december saturday mission time 8 45 pm to 11 pm okay so i unshare now uh Derek. okay yeah wow that was like totally interesting so yeah, um yeah i know i think uh what, what are your what are your you know kind of like just parting a bit from reality here, but what 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 kind of like maybe you dream that might be discovered by yeah you know okay. this uh, <laughs> so allow me to tell you a bit long story a long story. So in the high school when I was studying in Maxwell School in Kuala Lumpur in the 1960s years ages ago, we read that there's a thing called the there were two competing theories of the origin of the universe the Big Bang. And the steady state theory. So I, I think you are aware of the steady state theory, eh? Steady state theory. So I was very keen on the steady state theory. So no confirmation of the Big Bang. Hey, so we're not keen on the Big Bang. Steady state theory. Then at the end of the 60s, hey, they discovered the cosmic microwave background. I went to university later on uh, in 71 in USM. Confirmed. Unions came from Big Bang. So they throw away my paper theory. So many astronomers like steady state. So throw away steady state, Big Bang. So the Big Bang said that the universe expand, 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 and you stop. There's enough mass in the universe, critical mass, to stop the expansion and go back to the big crunch. So back to the big crunch was the was the table of many people, including me. It was only in the 1990s they, they studied the supernova type two huh, that actually the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It's an open universe scenario. So keep on changing. So so there's a paradigm. <clears throat> After some time, you change. No more big uh, steady state, big bang. And then later on, you have expansion of units accelerating. Throw away your old idea of stop expansion coming back. Now you expand for other. So I'm sure that in terms of cosmology, yeah, the web will revolutionize cosmology. So maybe now, <laughs> this is a kind of a, a kind of a, a, a imagination of mine. In the drawing, but now people don't use uh, paper, chalk, and board. And now they use whiteboard and micro pen. Many of the theoretical astronomers, theoretical physicists around the world, getting maybe their marker pen on the whiteboard. See what web will do so that it will throw away the old theory and come up with a new theory. What what will web do? Huh? Uh, what will web do? So that means uh, 
they yeah, will wow. Or what they will find, maybe. You know? Oh, they oh, will make a new discovery yeah. that come up with, with kind of result which even today you cannot imagine. One thing is like this, uh, like you mentioned just now, there's a there's actually time, the big bang, and then inflation, then expand. But you didn't ask the even greater question which some people ask, sir, what happened before the big bang? <laughs> now, I remember 1980s, you read, people ask Hawking, eh? uh, no, Professor Hawking, what happened be before the big bang? Don't ask me. Of course, he, he cannot talk like that. Like, he pressed his finger on his uh, synthesizer. So he said, you give me the Big Bang, I can explain after that if very well what happened. But what happened before Big Bang, I surrender. But now a lot of work now done in cosmology, you know. They are saying that, for example, you might have heard of this called M theory, M from Malaysia, M theory that actually you can explain that uh, before the Big Bang, there's some possibility. Because you apply M, M theory, which is cosmology that the Big Bang occur according to M theory because the collision of two brains, B R A N E, from the, the, the analogy of membrane. So the Big Bang occurred because of the collision of two membranes. And when the two membranes of this membrane is not like the sheet of, of rubber, no, it's a kind of theoretical construct. Because the two brains collided, the Big Bang occurred. And from you, you can, I've not seen all the calculations, I've seen some of the assembly of the result. When two brains collide, the Big Bang occurred, the universe is born. You cannot avoid the conclusion that parallel universes are created at the same time. So you have a Big Bang occurred That's because of the Big Bang. Well, the solution of the genetic of reality, which is our application of genetic of reality, parallel universe can be formed. Multiverse, wow. multiverse. Uh, so now That's uh, very fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so if this uh, James Webb can see further than the uh, Hubble, I can see in front of it some signature and the and the popular signature say that there is some parallel universe. Then paradigm shift. There are possible alternate parallel universe, multiverse. Remember, <laughs> I remember in the 1990s, remember there's a famous American talk show host, David Letterman. David Letterman, I'm going to interview yes. all kinds of people, celebrities, including scientists. Okay. He was interviewing, I think, the astronomer royal. What's his name? Huh? Sir Martin Rees. Oh, Martin Rees, yeah. Of yeah. UK. Martin Rees, yes. And Martin Rees came up with a famous book. I didn't read it, but I saw the summary. Uh, multiverse. I thought of multiverse. That was in okay. the 1990s. Right. So we hope such a thing can happen. Uh, that means there's a parallel universe. So if, let's say, like, if there's a kind of uh, experimental result, that there is a possibility that you can multiverse there no because they see the signature of the big bang doesn't follow the standard model of cosmology instead mm -hmm. the, the data they get goes against the standard model so they revise the standard model and in revising the standard model you must put in the parallel universe all right so once, once you see you got parallel units then what you what what is happening so can we make a kind of communication machine that can communicate with the other parallel units also better can you make a, a kind of a, a, a not not space time traveling machine? Can you make a multiverse traveling machine from our universe travel to another one like this? Uh? Mm. Uh, so like this, and then it goes. It, once you find some idea that multiverse universe are exist, uh, then people will go more onto multiverse. I'm working on cosmology research. So now, uh, this question has been asked for many people. For example, they are uh, Stephen Hawking. How, according to you, Professor, how many possible multiverses are there? Now, this is the number he quoted, famous, no? Don't fall down from the chair, huh? <laughs> Daddy. 10 to the power of 500. Oh. Oh. 10 to the power of 500. Wow. A humongous figure. Oh. Humongous figure. Un unimaginable number. Unimaginable, so many. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't put it out of the head, you know? A lot of calculation. <laughs> But I think about, was it after the year 2000? I saw the research paper. I remember after the collapse of the Soviet Union, many of the famous scientists in Russia, including the, the astronomers, the left Soviet Union and went, went to work in America. So one of them is, I forgot his name, very famous uh, uh, Russian theoretical scientist and his uh, friend from Russia. I forgot their name. He went to America. They calculated, this is the number they quote now. 
the first the possible number of L units is 10 to the power of 7 to the power of 7. No, 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 no. I think something like 10 to the power of 7 to the power. Of, sorry, sorry, I made a mistake. 10 <laughs> okay. to the power of 10. And the second time, on top of it, to the power of 10, to the power of 7. Wow. Okay. 10, power 10, power 10, power 7. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, that means uh, the total number of possible parallel universe is more than the electrons and quarks in, the, in our present universe. Very good. Wow. Like this. So what I'm saying is that we hope like that. Actually, now, as of today, eh, they have some experiment for example, the cosmic background telescope in the South Pole, eh? they are looking yes. for a certain type of signature of the cosmic background. They use the name, they are studying the polarization aspect. Polarization, yeah, the, yeah. The, what's uh, it, the, the name of the telescope in the South Pole. Alma is it? Is it no, Alma is in Chile. This is in the South Pole. Alma is in Chile. In oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so never mind. So basically, yeah, anyways, uh, yeah. so something about the, 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 the change in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. So if they say that, yes, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah. the data they receive uh, is different from what they expect, uh, then they have to think of something about the Big Bang, which is different from what we know now. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, I would say that James Webb can change our idea of the Big Bang. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, we, we think like that. Uh, so, like this, uh, so we have to follow. Uh, follow. <laughs> so I, 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 that's like, one of the most uh crazy things i think that uh you know we can imagine so yeah but i i think that uh you know that's i think a very nice closing statement that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah sir. so okay yeah, yeah. So, well, so i i think that uh you know with with dr chong's uh fascinating discourse here on like uh what's possible um we'll just sit down and look so one, more, one more thing before Michael pass the question. So Derek, on that day, 18th of December, you see my hand like that. A <laughs> lot of uh, tissue protecting my fingers. Uh. <laughs> my fingernail protector <laughs> on that day. Oh. Okay, Michael, fingernail please. Protector. Oh, okay. There's a there's a question by uh our 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 very own uh astrophotographer. Okay, CK Lo. How JWST can avoid meteorite from hitting it? I, I think there's no way, right? There's no way we can get avoid getting hit. So, I just my my, my take is the area of a tennis court in in empty space, which is basically us orbit around the sun, uh, 150 million kilometers to the sun. Oh, what are the chances of that area, area that hundred uh twenty one kilometer by forty meter? Some meat micro meat passing through. Oh no, everything will pass through. So that means yeah. they must have plan into design that you pass through the sun shield, thin plastic sheet will break them, okay. But don't have a big lamb, right? Mm -hmm. So they know yeah. even hitting the 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 18 segment, I think still okay. Mm -hmm. But we hope that no big uh need to write. Not we must understand no. Doesn't mean that the size of like that, no, gone. Nah. The whole of this is my sticker, gone. Nah. Oh yeah, yeah. Tiny <laughs> green of dust is very great, you know. Yeah, right? the moment, the uh, kinetic so energy is so so yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's another question that uh, I think we did mention, right? The design expected lifespan of the James Webb. Uh, 10 years, yeah. 10 years, right? Yeah. So okay. it's expected to last about 10 years, but. Yeah. Okay. Before that, I just uh, add on to what I answered earlier is that we know that. Uh, one AU from the sun, the sun occasionally will give up solar flare, prominence, and so on. You know, now it's solar, including building. You know? So that means in the coming years, the working the 10 years of James Webb, the sun will have exceptionally powerful burst. So all these charged electrons, photons, they hit the James Webb, not to say like, like a hurricane, uh, may affect. Not necessarily blow blow the the james web of course no affect the electronics problem so if all the charged protons are plasma flying past the james web huh? and it can affect communication satellite it will definitely affect james web so i think yeah, i just, uh, certainly hope that they do some radiation shielding you know like and they have, I, I i bet that they would expect 
yeah, yeah. Oh, I wonder how much class of a flair that he can like. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So be, yeah. that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, so, uh, for example, we know that uh, in uh, in the in the meaty uh, domain, they call it hardening. So you you fire a hydrogen bomb, the electronic pulse is such that your electronic electronics are unprotected; it be burned out. Hardening, you put a kind of a shield or a metallic shield or whatever. I don't know. I maybe maybe that could be hardened like that. Now ten years, sir. Uh, so ten years uh, for for this uh, ball aerospace and not of government uh, is a long time. So it, it it that means it should perform perfectly there for ten years, lah. Uh. If it cannot perform more than that, that means maybe next time they won't give the two companies the same contract. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but usually, <laughs> like Harbour was also ten years. Now thirty years. Bonus la. So we expect James Webb would be better than 10 years la. So we have a lot of bonus la. So Webb, Hubble is still working now. The, the problem is that Hubble is it's not that it cannot work, it is working. Of course, the, the servo mechanism, the gyros are one by one coming down. It's still working. The problem is they will not have enough funds by NASA to maintain Hubble. The funding is not enough. That's it. Uh, money. <laughs> uh, money. No, no, it's working. So, we can go another five years. We can go to 2030, but then no funding. Uh, these are the reasons. So what happened in that case? Because Hubble is quite low, low orbit, you know. They have to deorbit Hubble. So, so we, uh, if that's the case, then we will see the demise of Hubble burning in the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Some amateur in Chile will see that. <laughs> hey, but now it's web. We hope web will work. Yeah. yeah. So. I think a uh, good time to, good place to conclude. Um, for all the viewers out there, thank you very much for following our program. I, I hope that uh, what we presented today uh, was very informative. Uh, I, I myself am totally fascinated by all the presentation that Dr. Chong had. And of course, I hope that you found the entire uh, presentation to be informative as well. And all of us are again, as Dr. Chong points out, biting our nails. Yeah. Down to 18 December <laughs> evening, huh? Saturday night. December Saturday night, don't go anywhere. Yes. Okay. Just don't watch your Manchester United football. Watch the launch of the James West Space Telescope and follow it for 30 minutes. Yes. Okay. okay. Huh? So thank you very much. And, thank you, uh, Dr. Derek Lim. Huh? Thank yeah. you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And from yeah. the Astronomical Society of Penang, thank you. And please click like our sub and subscribe our channel. Uh, hope to see you guys in the next program that we have. Take care, stay safe, have a good evening. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. Okay.